morning, everyone. Welcome to this morning's meeting, uh, How Left is Green Politics. My name's Becky. I'm a member of the Socialist Workers' Party in South London. I'm your chair today. We're very pleased to welcome the Deputy Leader of the Green Party, Shara Ali to Marxism 2016. And he'll... Thank you. And he's going to be speaking on the topic for about 35 minutes, after which time we'll open it up to questions and comments. Thank you very much. Thanks so much. Um, so, do you prefer a political talk or a intellectual type seminar? Political. <laughs> <laughs> the two are not mutually exclusive. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I can change the world. <laughs> okay, that's good. And we'll write that down. In the next 35 minutes. <laughs> 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 So, uh, well, in that case, I will, I will start with some introductory programmatic comments, so to speak, and then we will have plenty of opportunity to debate after that. Um, so you're entitled to know what I think of the question which I've posed, how left is green politics? And I will just um, invite you to interrupt me at any point, because there sometimes, as in life, there may be a burning question which you want to have addressed straight away. And if so, you know, we can decide if necessary, if I want to take it later, that's absolutely fine. Or I may just take some notes here so I can make sure we get back to it by the end. But really, I guess um, the re my interest in this question is, is twofold. Not only in terms of the, the definitions at stake. What do we mean by the left? Um, given that we've got a very broad spectrum of people here from left to right, I'm sure. No, but seriously... It's useful to, to know, actually, what we mean by that, and there will be different classifications. I was just checking, actually, at the outset, uh, when these terminologies were first, and as somebody knows, uh, come again? Yeah, absolutely, 1789. And then there was a kind of an evolution in the way in which these terms were used. So they stuck. They stuck in, initially, obviously, they were used to define sides of the room, if you will. But then they became a bit more diverse in their labelling capacity. And so we might want to have a, a think about that and whether we agree with those. But really, an opening gambit, if you will, about what we mean by left, in a very general way, is social justice and egalitarianism. I hope nobody would dissent from that. But of course, there is a whole spectrum within that. And it's getting used increasingly, and it has been, as a way for people to, in politics especially, to self-define and classify and to try and appeal and to communicate. So the twofold aim really for me, I think the thing that interests me about the sort of interconnection, the overlap, the, the room for manoeuvre, if you will, between green politics and the left generally in politics is not just definitional but also in terms of communication. So that the other aspect to this, which I think it would be useful for us to think about, whether or not you identify with green politics or not, is how useful the terms are. Because you may find that if I say egalitarianism, that's going to put some people off. If I say left, that might put a few people off. And I, I guess I'm interested in inclusivity in the debate, inclusivity in politics generally. And I'm hopeful that whatever language that we're using doesn't alienate, doesn't, if you like, make it more difficult for us to express our political position and ultimately to get people coming on board. And also just to add in the mix, if you like. Um, so when I go around and, and, and talk and speak to even Greens, I had one particular challenge. Uh, we've got an association of Green councillors and at the AGM last year, they asked me to speak to a particular topic soon after the general election. Their primary concern was how to appeal to conservative voters. So that was the challenge. And there was a tension there, there was an understandable tension there, is that, well, can the Greens appeal to uh, Conservative voters? So there you see, if we are to be identifiable and identify ourselves, and I think that's the key thing we need to consider, is the difference between how people can be identified in some objective sense and how they choose to identify and whether they're right about that. But if if the Green Party, if you will, um, self-identifies, whatever that might mean exactly, come to that maybe, as of the left, then are we potentially selling ourselves short when we then seek to engage with Conservative voters, given the political reality of the situation, which might be that in predominantly rural areas, 
where we have conservative strongholds, it may not do us much good as Greens or even other parties of the left to speak in a language which doesn't engage with those who are predominantly conservative voters. So is there something which the Greens have which can appeal across that political spectrum? So I think hopefully by the time we get to the end we want to have a clearer sense, I hope, of whether or not also the way in which we self-identify could potentially be selling ourselves short, in particular, in particular for green politics, and whether there might not be something else behind that. And even in the opening gambit, if you like, the definition of the left in politics, and just to keep it as broad as possible at the moment, because I think there are other very interesting characteristics and clues about what we mean by the left, but even if it is just predominantly um, a dedication, if you will, to social justice, to equality then isn't there anything ever, hasn't there been something, even in the Conservative Party, which to whom any of us in this room could even appeal? Um, you could call it uh, social conservatism, one nation Toryism. You know, I mean, one of my favourite jokes on the hustings if I'm up against Conservative candidates and they sound even mildly reasonable is that I will brand them as the social conservatives of the party. And then we'll quickly find out that they are... Um, generating lots of contradictions later on down the line. But the fact is that even, so, even those, that brand of conservatism, if, such as they exist, do try and appeal um, in certain meetings to social justice or caring, compassion. Those aren't w words which are completely alien to some conservative uh, parliamentarians. And I think it would be interesting, interesting, except IDS, of course, but the thing is, is that it would be interesting to, it would be interesting to actually just to note, really, whether or not the way in which we self-identify, if we go too far along the spectrum of the left, if we start calling ourselves extreme left, far left, what purpose politically does that language have? Yes? Could it also risk um, excluding us from engaging with people in the, the conservative factions? Perhaps what's tending to happen here is... Oh, I'll take you in a second, yeah. What's tending to happen here is that when we talk about the extreme left or the far left or the radical left, I think, is better, because extreme sounds already a pejorative. But if we're talking about some radical movements, that anti-racist movements, for example, they are set up predominantly as a political action. And so the language we use is very important, because they're then there to deal and to combat the far right. And we know that they exist, fascism. So you can see that this kind of spectrum can actually have lots of political usage and the vocabulary is very important that we understand it and get it. So I've said just a little bit about what we could mean by left. We had a question there. Why don't we just take, or a point? No, don't worry. No? Okay. Yeah, no, so, uh, well, with, with the proviso that um, you may not be able to prevent yourself. We don't have any hecklers here. That's not very good. So, look... <laughs> <laughs> I think the other thing I want to throw in the mix then at the outset is that there was a, a survey done not so long ago, Queen Mary University, earlier in the year, and there have been other ones done before that, trying to show what do your common or garden voter, for example, think uh, about the parties on a spectrum of left-right, and the Greens came out better, so to speak, than Labour on that. The Greens came out as the perception of the Greens as being more left than Labour. And clearly there are a lot of people in the Green Party. There's even a self-identifiable group of people, cohort, if you want. Personally, I think that the Green Party is nothing if not a left party, so that's fine. I don't care too much for the distinction between Green Left and everybody else. I think that that demarcation you know, might serve some purpose. But people in Green Left actually took heart from that because their, their idea was that um, it just demonstrates that people get that, they understand that, and it's important for us that we can promote politics on that score. But I think there was an additional element to this um, survey, which is interesting, doubly interesting, is that what do party members themselves think of where they sit on the left-right spectrum? So where did, what was the answer to that? Well, the, green, the, the voters themselves were pretty much um, in track. Labour voters were saying similar things about green, um, the Green Party as it being more left than Labour. Now, um, perhaps we should have had a greater plurality of parties out there because one of the things that is going to assist or facilitate um, left of Labour parties is, relative to Labour, how left is Labour. 
One of the reasons why um, commonly given as a reason for people joining the Green Party, particularly throughout the Blair years, is that they had lost touch with their roots. What happened in the, in the, in the Green... I, actually, I must uh, be careful not to go off too much on a tangent, but I think a little bit of the daily politics is useful as well. Yes? I find your positional analysis, your linguistic analysis, absolutely fascinating. Yes. But what I came here to find out about is, what is your programme for the bourgeois state? Okay, we will try and encapsulate that at the end. Right, I don't even need to write that down. I can remember that question. So, let's just bear in mind that part of the reason why we are engaging groups, Green Party included, chooses to self-identify in these terms is to appeal to a political movement, some of whom may feel disenfranchised or no longer able to sit within the grouping that they originally did. And so certainly through the Blair years, that was very common, whether it's the Iraq war or for, other, for similar types of reason. And um, when, I was just going to mention in passing that when Corbyn I bet that name hasn't been used at all yet throughout <laughs> Marxism <laughs> Festival. When Corbyn got the leadership, we didn't really have much of a problem knowing what to say within the Green Party, and I'm proud of that, because we like to look beyond narrow party politics. And for us, and certainly one of the things I was saying, was that it's great that a party now has the leader it deserves. I'm not presuming to know whether any of you here you know, are particularly Labour voters or not, but the point is, is that I think it's good for politics when at least a party or a position or a leader represents and says what it does on the tin. Just in terms of knowing what people stand for, there's a lot to be said for that, as opposed to a kind of a playing an inner politics and then an external politics. It's almost like Jeremy Bentham's government house utilitarianism, which I've never really been able to get my head around. The idea that you're going to sell something to the public, knowing what's in their best interest, but you can't tell them the truth because they probably wouldn't then know how to behave. There's a bit of a conundrum there. Um, well, I, I, think, I think it's false to underestimate the intelligence of the voting public, to underestimate the intelligence of the people. It's no good even to say that people voted in ignorance. They always are enabled to vote in ignorance. That's up to them. And who are we to say um, that they haven't voted in what their idea of self-interest is? And generally... The individual is the best judge of their interests. But if you take the, the historical moment of Corbyn gaining that leadership, Greens uh, that I know, and certainly amongst the leadership, were happy about it. They thought that was a good thing because finally, whether or not it might have affected our membership, for us, there was something beyond narrow party politics which appealed to us. We wanted to have a functional um, Labour Party which did what it said on the tin. Now, of course, we can quarrel about what, what is the cause of the dysfunction here, and I, I don't think the fact that you know, uh, Labour parliamentarians have clubbed together in, in a sort of a groupthink precipitous way is any sign, or any sign of uh, dysfunction other than of themselves, potentially. So, I mean, you can check. I've just, I did a, had a blog um, last week in aptly named Left Foot Forward about this. But it's worth bearing in mind, then, that sometimes, uh, even, if we, even if we find, even if we think that the true characteristics, definitionally, of being left, even on this spectrum, don't entirely fit what we think that party stands for in terms of its ideology, we might still leave some space open for the rhetoric, if you like, the cut and thrust of political rhetoric and the way in which that engages people. But let me now say something about, and we'll come back to social justice and egalitarian, because there are uh, other things and characteristics which I think we'll want to say, but I think... I can do that by first turning to green politics and identifying why I would say that that is firmly in the left camp, and I think we can be unashamed about that, and here's why. So firstly, I think one of the things that green politics has, let's just take three values. These are three ways in which I would frame green politics even in, in, in these islands. Firstly, one of the things that we're very hot on is inclusivity. And at the moment, if you think about the politics of the day, the way in which... Um, leaders of the, the mainstream party, so to speak, uh, appeal to the voters, it's very much looking after number one. It has been, you know, particularly since the Thatcher era. So it's what I can do for you, what's the bottom line? Now, we would say, of course, that with relative poverty and even poverty being as high as it ever has been in terms of fuel poverty, all the things that people being on the sharp end in terms of um, the austerity program, that, you know, poverty really, really hits people. It kills people. And so... 
Important though that is, I think one of the things that the Greens do is they broaden out the number of classes of stakeholders, if you will. So we want to say, we give you that, we grant the politician that the self-interest, if you will, of the individual is important and is a motivator. And it's what gets people out to vote. And it's something that you need to attend to when you set out your political programme. I wouldn't deny that. But if you think about what inclusivity really says, it's saying that, hang on, um, unlike this sort of laissez-faire economic model that we're rammed down our throats on a daily basis, it's the economy stupid. Individuals, even when they're looking after number one, aren't just looking after themselves. Because some of the things and the values that matter to them aren't just about themselves. Whether it's your family members, whether it's your neighbourhood or your community, whether it's people halfway up the country or halfway around the world, these are ways of expanding your circle of interest and community. And one of the things that I think green and socialist movements do very well is they tend to be internationalist. They tend to take some account of how their decisions and actions are impacting people in other parts of the world, whether it's anti-consumerist agenda, whether it's trying to attend to ethical consumerism or the ills, uh, the, the, the fatalities of capitalism, unfettered capitalism. So in, by inclusivity, I simply mean that don't assume, even if you are appealing to the individual, that you can settle what counts as within their interests. Part of their interests are going to be include other people. So let, that's the kind of the marks of a selfish society is to think otherwise. But inclusivity, by inclusivity, there's much more to, to that in green politics. There's also human beings, of course, are included in that, what, what we tend to speak um, in politics about. But people who aren't around yet is also a part of green politics. I would say, and as I may sort of end up arguing by the end of my bit, is, is that the left description does not encapsulate probably all that I'd want to say about green politics. And one of the ways in which it doesn't, is I don't think the left to now has had enough to say about future generations. It hasn't really figured so much on its radar. Of course, you can have environmental causes and the legacy of nuclear waste. But do you really want not to take greater attention to people 50, 100 years into the future? What kind of legacy are we leaving behind for them? Are we going to be even leaving behind a planet with breathable air and, and you know, the sight of, of the sun? Um, beautiful that that is, and completely ignored by current um, economic system that that is. There's no way of evaluating the value of a beautiful sunset. Okay? But if you've got a smog-sphere sky, then you, know, you might reckon that that's something that's missing from, from a life. So in terms of future generations, that's just one way in which I think the Greens are very, they're all inclusive. But it's not just about human beings either. It's also about non-human animals. So what are our obligations, duties? To what extent should we take account of um, non-human uh, species? The animal kingdom in terms of how we treat them in the industrial uh, food chain or even in animal experimentation. You know, whether there aren't things that we should be saying about that. So you can see in a nutshell that there are um, attitudes that you could have towards uh, non-human animals and that doesn't really seem to fit very well in a sort of a left-right spectrum, and nor does concerns about <coughs> other species or the planetary uh, ecosystem in general. If we feel, I mean, look, here's, here's a thought experiment. You've got sort of two scenarios. Okay, so scenario A is a planet which is totally dead, by which I mean there's no life on it. I'm not saying we're heading there. I mean, because the way we're heading, we might still have cockroaches left on our planet. But the fact is, is that let's just assume there's no life on this planet, okay? And you've got another scenario, which is just as it is now, except no human beings, homo sapiens. Now, can I put to you, uh, raise your hands if you want, I mean, who, which scenario is better? The one with the, what, the totally dead planet or the one which is just like ours, except there are no human beings on it? Which is better? Who thinks that the dead planet is better or that they're equivalent? Yes. Nobody will know. <laughs> right. Now that's good. That's good. That's a little bit like the last chance saloon in the Age of Stupid where the, uh, Pete Possilwaite is sort of lamenting that you're sending a, a beam of data 
into outer space and you don't know who's actually going to see that and what value is associated with somebody knowing that you know, there's this library uh, associated with the human race. But isn't it, is anybody here prepared to say then, this is called the leading question, that the second scenario is better than the first scenario because there is life on it even though it doesn't include the human race? It's only within the context of humans. It, it, the question makes no sense. I'll come to that. <laughs> Just, is anybody prepared to say... Yeah? Well, no, it's good. It's good that there's a disagreement there because you might think that all value is premised or, on or conditioned by human beings actually being able to observe it or see it. Or you might think there's some kind of subspecies eternitus, you know, sort of in the, in the eye of God, which isn't conditional on human beings having to be around, and therefore you're prepared to ascribe some value. Right? At the end of the day, politics is about value. We care about the fact that people are being disenfranchised, disempowered, and made to suffer and don't have their basic needs. Politics is about value and priorities. But let's, all, let's start by working out what values the, the logic of the left-right spectrum includes and excludes, and let's see whether there might not be some stuff missing, because one of the things that might motivate people to try and save this beautiful planet of ours is that it would be a great loss, not to us, but generally... Simpliciter, unequivocally, if all those other planetary species went too. And that could be a motivator, and that's worth knowing about. But if you think, I would dare to, I would dare to call it rather anthropocentric, right? If you think that all value is premised on us being there, sort of Robinson Crusoe-like, if there's nobody left, this is the last man, then it doesn't really matter what happens. There's no morality even. But that then doesn't, I think, fit very neatly into left-right, but I do think it's part of the basis of green politics. I think we're very inclusive about who are the stakeholders, whether it's people halfway around the world who we're never going to see, whether it's non-human animals who we care about how we treat them when we're actually butchering them, or, or whether it's about the planet, planetary species that we share the planet with as well. Bourgeois, question again? No, I was going to ask you about what happened to the other great <laughs> Well, I'm not, I'm not advocating, certainly not in this uh, meeting, that we give them the vote. I don't think that would be very easy <laughs> to manufacture. However, I do think that animals, particularly higher animals, do have certain... Um, we do have obligations towards them in terms of they are sentient, they can suffer, they can feel pain, and I think we need to take them into consideration. They have interests. So what's the other value, I would say, that really does um, inform green politics? Well, I've, I've already mentioned it, and I think this is where the left really comes into its own. It's equality's agenda. Now... I mean, egalitarianism is a fancy word, but at the bottom there are the basic needs. Health, housing, I, I would probably enlist education there insofar as certainly in Western civilised countries it's a means through which you can either gain some sort of social mobility or improvement um, in how you do that. And that's one of the things that have been systematically undermined by successive governments, whether it's you know, tuition fees or a whole gamut of things. You know, Blair's sort of refrain, the more, the more you learn, the more you earn. I mean, what a bastardization of education. What's wrong with the more you learn, the more you learn? Because really, education at bottom is political. Yeah? Don't, anybody, don't let anybody tell you, and I know there'll be a lot of people who work in education here, don't let anybody tell you not to get political. Because that's like not having a voice. That's what the prevent strategy has been responsible for. It's preventing and stopping people from actually speaking their minds. I mean, it's a pretty messed up world we live in. Yeah? If, you, if a child in a primary school, can't even ventilate and articulate the stupidities and nonsenses of the world without fear of being persecuted and people coming and knocking on their door and saying, you know, what are you doing to your child? Then we haven't got any hope. So I think university campuses and, you know, SOAS and other places near here have a, have a very strong tradition of that. Free speech counts. I mean, I personally, I don't actually agree with the thresholds that are being applied in terms of not allowing platforms to people. I actually think that have it out there, yeah? Have it out there. If you even think about the BNP when they got into the London Assembly... You know, since we're not far from the city hall, you know, they didn't, they didn't, they didn't survive a second term because people saw what they were like, how dysfunctional and ideologically bankrupt they were. So I think there's a lot of value in free speech. So to return to the point, equality, ed education, I think, is one of those. But there's a lot of other things that come under equality, which may not often be captured by the term anti-discrimination initiatives, right? So we rail against discrimination in all its forms, whether it's gender, the gender pay gap, whether it's the fact that if you're an Asian woman, you're going to be doubly disadvantaged than an Asian man even to get a job or even to get on, on the interview. So these kinds of injustices we care about, whether it's uh, on the basis of sexuality, these kind of injustices we care about. And peace, 
I mean, the warmongers, the warmongers of this country who still need to be brought to book, and we've got in a few days' time, obviously, the Chilcot Inquiry, and I look forward to reading that. I'd urge anybody, don't just look at the, don't just look at the preamble. You, know, you have to you know, wade through the whole, because they're going to get sanitised otherwise. But I think the thing is, is that, and, I mean, why is Blair doing the rounds? Every, I mean, he's, he's constantly there, yeah? He's a harassed political figure. And, it's in, it, and he's, he has every right to be. But we're hearing more of him at the Chilcot approaches, and there's a reason for that. It's just media manipulation that he's playing up. That's all that he's about. It's about damage, uh, damage limitation and reputational risk management for him, right? But so the equalities agenda doesn't just include the social justice and making sure that people have their basic needs met. It also includes the politics of anti-discrimination. So that's very important to us. That's very dear to us. And I would put it, and, you know, let's be honest about this. It's, it's been said to me when I've been on sort of the anti-fascistic movements and all the rest of it. It's been said to me that why don't we see more Greens here? And I'm quite interested in that because I, f I feel that the left, the self-identifiably left, are very highly represented at those demonstrations and I'm proud of that. Is there something about the in environmentalist, the environmental movement, or the Green Party which doesn't lend itself to us being out there in as great numbers? I wouldn't say the same is true about the anti-war movement. I think we've been, you know, key advocates for that. But in terms of the importance of anti-fascism, there is something that, you know, I think the left is very strongly identifiable with. And I would say at bottom it's about equality, because what, what else is that except equality? I think the third sort of value, if you like, that runs through uh, green politics is how we do politics. And that's the area under which I would want to enlist some other important characteristics and dimensions of what counts as left-leaning. Because at the end of then, I did have a quote here from uh, 1947, Scottish sociologist Robert MacIver. Let's just read this. The right is always the party sector associated with the interests of the upper or dominant classes. The left, the sector expressive of the lower economic or social classes, and the centre, that of the middle classes. Historically, this criterion seems acceptable. The conservative right has defended entrenched prerogatives, privileges, and powers. The left has attacked them. The right has been more favorable to the aristocratic position, to the hierarchy of birth or of wealth. The left has fought for the equalization of advantage or of opportunity, for the claims of the less advantaged. Defense and attack have met under democratic conditions, not in the name of class, but in the name of principle but the opposing principles have broadly corresponded to the interests of the different classes. Now, that is a very interesting analysis. I think there's a lot to be said for it, and I think that one of the things that defines us and helps us to self-define as left is to do with how we tackle gross power abuse. So just in terms, if you think about speaking truth to power, again, democratic societies, when they become despotic, one of the main things you lose is freedom of speech, and that's very important to us, and, and the government realises that. You know, when they roll out all their... Um, excessive uh, anti-terror legislation, clamping down on our civil liberties, our rights, our rights to, to, to congregate, to even protest outside the House of Commons of all places. That's actually creating an oppressive environment. So one of the things I think that we're good at, and I think I would firmly add it to the list of things that characterise what counts as being left, is this speaking truth to power and confronting and challenging those... Um, hierarchies where they're not justified. Now that isn't to say, and it's interesting then that if you do that, you can see how communist movements are then explainable as left movements, because they are about power um, being balanced or organised in a way which is justified and legitimate. I think the thing is, is that I'm not saying that. Yes. Sorry. So why is it then that, as you noted, that the Greens aren't? I was simply pointing out that I think we are very much at the forefront of the anti-war movement. We're certainly on the forefront of those environmental and climate change demonstrations. I, I think it's true, because somebody just pointed out to me as a matter of fact, and I think it might be sociological and not so much to do with principle, because I think you can get Greens out on a demonstration to do with, obviously, anti-fascism. But I think it might be a sociological thing. You know? It's just who has taken the responsibility and who feels included. Because like it or not, some people sort of gravitate towards people who they feel like. And there might be other things in the mix, not just along this left-right spectrum, but class, potentially. There might be things which is 
putting people off from joining those movements, and I think they'd be wrong to do that, because I think it needs to be an all-inclusive movement, and it's more, it, it will be stronger for it. So I can't presume to know why that is, but I think that you know, we want uh, people in the Green Movement to be equally involved and dynamic about those anti-fascist movements. So in terms of the power imbalance and the power structure, absolutely, yeah, no problem with hitting that mark. So I think the thing is, is that in terms of the power imbalance, well, here's one out of stroke, which is, you know, on this birthday anniversary of the Queen, I think, you know, it's an opportunity for us actually to, to talk about it a bit more. And I wonder whether this is a, a Green Party position or as much a, a left position. And I think it would be recognisably something you would expect people of the left to say, to believe in a certain kind of democracy, to believe in a non-hierarchical society where people... Uh, assume power and authority over you, even if they don't use it with all those vestiges of power that remain in terms of sign-off, sign-off going to war, sign-off in terms of the Queen's speech, yet yeah, still call the Queen's speech. So why are those formalities still required of us, and don't they actually influence the way that uh, we live and the way in which power is actually uh, distributed across society? So, of course, the Green Party campaigns for um, not just the reform of the House of Lords, but also, um, you know, the wholesale uh, removal of that kind of a monarchy. And there may be other things associated with the monarchy which you think you can keep, but in terms of the constitutional basis and the constitutional elements of the monarchy, that is totally unjustified as far as we're concerned. And it grates against your sense of equality of opportunity and meritocracy, anything uh, remotely associated with the meaning of the term. So I would suggest then that if that's also part of this sort of cluster condition of what counts as being left in politics, it's a very key one, how we do politics. You will find the Greens, maybe even in greater numbers than those people, maybe that's why they're not coming to those demonstrations, because they clash. But, you know, the thing is, is that we are very involved in non-violent direct action. You'll see environmentalists sort of scaling heights and stuff. But, you know, the Heathrow 13, for example. The Heathrow 13, um, I mean, an extraordinary moment, actually, during the trial. You know, obviously, they were charged. They got a smaller sentence than, than we feared. But I think one, the great moment in the, in the trial, as far as I'm concerned, was one of, one of the defendants turned around to the, the judge and said, look, in terms of having to justify why they would trespassed and broken all these rules... And they said, well, look, we knew what we were doing. We knew what we were doing just as much as the suffragettes did, which helped give rise to you, you, ma'am, sitting where you are now. So I think the thing is, is that one of the things that the Green Party is very good at, I think, is understanding that, you know, the law, the law is not just some given. It's a, it's a convention. It's an institutional apparatus. You know, just as when Rosa Parks refused to give in her seat to a racist request on a bus in 1955 Alabama, here I sit, I can do no other, right? And then she was told, well, if you continue to do that, I'm going to have to call the police. Said, well, you're going to have to. You're going to have to do that then. I think the thing is that those kind of structures and power imbalances need to be challenged. And so I think, you know, the way to do that, whether it's suffragette movement or other movements or Rosa Parks who helped inspire potentially a civil rights movement, I think the point is, is that it galvanizes people around, coalesces people around that particular ambition. And it, it enables us to say, ultimately, that the law is something which has also got to be judged against our conscience and our morality. The law is not something in a kind of establishment veil, establishment again, you know, power. We are going to challenge. We are going to be critical thinkers. We are going to say that this law is wrong and it needs to be challenged on moral grounds. And then the law will be changed. Otherwise, there would be no legal reform. So we have the vision. We have the capacity to understand that, to recognize. And I would say, as I've mentioned with education, the importance of free speech, the importance of challenging intellectually, and the importance ultimately of how that plays out in terms of our power structures, I would say then that what then is another point of contact between green politics and the left is just that, speaking truth to power. Thank you. I look forward to questions. Thank you very much. That was very engaging. Now, um, comrades, I'm sure you've been to meetings before. I will bring two people in at once, and then after, uh, by about quarter to one, I will bring our speaker back in to address specific points. You can have three minutes. After two minutes, I will tap, and then again at three minutes, and please do sum up so we can get as many people in. Um, so comrades here, and then comrades here and at the back, and then comrade in the front. Yes, please do, as Comrade here pointed out, please do come to the front as we are being recorded for Marxism, for okay. um, bookmarks. Um, what I want to do is I want to come back on the speaker in a, in a way that I think might be helpful for the, for the debate, which is to, to say I thought it was very interesting um, the way that you, you spoke about 
the the idea the ideas and the motivations and and the kind of uh, debates within the within the Green Party, and I think it's also interesting if you look internationally. For example, in countries uh, like e- Eastern Europe and, and Russia, where um, the notion of communism has been so associated, so discredited that most of the people who are mobilised do not define themselves as socialists. And in that context, engaging with with an audience of that nature, then it's necessary to go back to basics. And it seems to me that th- the way that socialists in the Socialist Workers' Party organise is not to um, be purists about their ideology and then just polish it uh, on a kind of annual basis at at conferences like this, but rather that we situate ourselves in the movement and we use the politics as a guide to action and agency. And I think it's the question of agency that I want to turn to because it seems to me that... When we talk about left and right, we're not simply talking about um, one, one, one side of a, a, a spectrum. What we're really talking about is agency, as the quote about the contending classes referred to. And in the, in the Socialist Workers' Party, we're part of a Trotskyist tradition, which has always established at its core an understanding that in order to really transform society, the left have to be able to reach out around the issues of the day and the, the, the struggles of the day and construct united fronts with organisations and individuals who do not share all of those common ideas. And that includes parts of the Green Party, but it's also a methodology which I think that the Green Party can learn from. So I offer it to them. And I think that the principle here is that you recognise that in order to win, you have to mobilise the maximum number of people, you have to convince the maximum number of people, but you don't try to turn that into a, simp- into a political programme which requires you to join the party. Instead, what you do is you mobilise on the issue at the time and you, 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 you fight to win. And you do so by focusing on agency, by focusing on where the power lies to change things. And it seems to me, therefore, it is right and proper that Green Party activists who are protesting against nuclear weapons can somehow get to leaflet the workers who work in Faz Lane or wherever it is and bring them out on strike. And it's a strategy that starts with the power to actually change the system. And that's not just by protesting, but it's about where where the working class lies and the power that workers have to change things. After this, comrade, comrade here and comrade in the blue scarf at the front. Okay, um, I'm Robbie Spence from uh, Culture of the Green Party, and I've got three things to come back on about the inclusivity and the equality um, and the, how we do politics. And so the first thing is, you know, I'm a white, middle-class, middle-aged bloke, and uh, while the Green Party does very well in terms of women, you've got one woman MP, Caroline Lucas, two out of three MEPs, but I think we don't do very well in terms of ethnic minorities. And, I mean, I'm, you know, so you're standing as to be re-elected as deputy leader, which I wish you great success with, but what can we do in the Green Party? What's, what's wrong with not attracting enough black, black and minority ethnic people? Um, and the second uh, point was about the equality. So you're talking about meeting basic needs for housing, health, education, and so on. And we, this question for like all the other left people here, how can we sell this idea of a no growth economy, whether you call it steady state or dynamic equilibrium or whatever, but we've got to have no growth or contraction and that's going to be not meeting a lot of people's needs for, you know, poor people getting better housing and, and so how, does, how, does it, how does that all work? Uh, how do you sell that to people on the left who want growth? Like Jeremy Corbyn wants to open coal mines in Wales again. Um, and then the third thing about how we do politics. So very, uh, po- I mean, I mean, I've often wondered within the Green Party whether you could have some kind of like a like militant was in the 80s. I mean, I know we all had all that fallout with Derek Hatton and, and David Nellis and falling out with Neil Kinnock and getting ejected. But you know, uh, you know, the, the Soviet workers are kind of like a revolutionary vanguard, wanting to be in place where if the chaos if everything breaks down, then we have somebody to look to to lead us. And I'm wondering, is there a place in the Green Party for people who are going to stand in that sort of role, or would we just get kicked out right away by the sort of Kinnock kind of person? I mean, um, I, I just wonder, you know, I, I'm in the Green Party because I believe we've got to spread that, you know, it's more, it, it has more appeal than the, than the SWP. I mean, it's kind of like more, uh, more visible. Um, so... Uh, it's a question about how do we, how can we have that kind of militancy within the Green Party? Is it, or would it, or should I just join the SWP instead? 
Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, comrades. After comrade here and here, um, uh, comrade at the back in the pink shirt, and then... Um, Just to come back on your point of why people don't really view green activists as being on the front... As being on the front line. Is that better? Yeah. yeah? I think I'm actually a member of the SWP, but I was a former Green Party member. I actually also stood for a councillor in May, mm -hmm. so I know a lot about Green... In, just in May, just the May gone. Yeah, where? Oh, in Salford. Yeah, Salford Ward. And I think there's a lot of reasons why the Green Party don't really are organised in such a way that a lot of their members aren't actually viewed on frontline positions, if you get what I mean. When you go to demonstrations in London, you see the SWP come out, you see them having stores, you see them selling papers. You don't really see Green Party members on the front line. And all credit to you and Natalie and Carole, Car Caroline. But I think that the lower level organisation of the Green Party is extremely poor. I find that when I first went to an SWP meeting, I was amazed because I'd never been to such a meeting before where I was sort of informed about different situations. I hadn't even heard of Marx or Lenin before any yeah. of this. And this was at a point where I'd been with the Greens for about six months and none of this mm. had ever been mentioned ever before. So I can see what you mean about, you know, that sort of people don't view Green Party activists as being on the front line because I find that the SWP are really the forefront of sort of street activism and the Greens tend to, re you know, really be within Parliament sort of thing. All right. Thank you. Uh, Tina Rothery, an anti-fracking campaigner. Um, I also, uh, and more obviously because we're fighting fracking, the Green Party came to prevalence for us. But I want to change the question is, because I think the more important question is how green is any politics? Because in the end, let's be realistic, no matter how many rights we fight for, if we don't deal with our responsibilities for what we leave our children and the health that we put ourselves in through the way that we treat the industries that we we're allowing through politics, then what is the point to anything? You know, we fight fracking because we know it's a clear and present danger to our country, and it's one that immediately threatens the health of our children, our livestock, the quality of our air, and our water. So that needs to be a prevalence that I don't necessarily see enough in left politics, or in right politics, or in any politics. And when the Greens do it, um, I think I'd argue with the last speaker because I've been five years on the front lines of anti-fracking at the camps and the movements, and I found many, many green members there. Maybe they don't have the placards, but you look what happened the other day at the Corbyn rally. They criticised the fact that they were socialist worker placards. So they said, oh, it's only them, it's, it's only them. You know, maybe you're not there because you're part of a movement. Maybe you're there because of your own moral core and your own wisdom that says, I need to be here. And you didn't need somebody's banner. You needed yourself to be there. And it's not always about fighting for your party or your political state within that action. I don't take actions to win anyone's politics. I take actions to win my grandchild's future. And maybe that's the difference. And I was thinking the other day when they did that with the social workers... Um, placards that you should maybe it would be nicer if instead of providing placards with words we provided placards with blank spaces and a pen so that each person could then be saying what they felt and maybe it would have some more legitimacy at that point I also think what's really important and what I've learned so much in the last three days of being here thank you so much Marxism never really dealt with it um, and this was three days of intense learning and that need and that awareness we have so much in common, people across all sorts of movements, that we need to bleed the edges of them and start merging. And, and, and much that what was said by the first question um, about the nuclear, let's tie in with the workers, let's tie in and make that work, you know, because we should be working together. And you know, if you had a party that was called anyone but the bloody conservatives, it'd be a hand down win. <laughs> but we need more than that in common. And I think sometimes that maybe one of those other commonalities that we can definitely find within all our movements and all our parties is a need to preserve the future for our children. And if we take that as our starting point, and I think certainly the Green Party does it, as does the SWP, then maybe that's a really good starting point for cooperation. And that's what we need to be more about. Responsibilities, not just rights. Thank you. After this comrade and the comrade in the front, we then have the guy in the green jacket, then guy in the glasses here, and then guy here. Thank you. Hi. 
Comrades, I, I, you don't need to read Naomi Klein, though it's worth it. This changes everything. Just listen to the most powerful man in the British state in the current crisis, Mark Carney, Governor of the Bank of England, who has said, the threat of climate change means that huge numbers of assets are going to have to be abandoned underground if we're doing anything about it. That is the key to why we have to be anti-capitalist if we're going to be green. We know that capitalism requires the exhaustion of all the resources, human, animal, earth, sky, sea. It requires that and it's pursuing it and it must be stopped. And we need to do that. Now, where I live, there is one non-Tory MP in the whole of the southwest of England. His name is Ben Bradshaw and his objective is to win the Tory vote. And so, as we say, all right, go and drown some more asylum seekers, Bradshaw, if that's how you think you'll win. Electoral politics, is that dead end? There's no power in Parliament, we know. It's in the Bank of England, it's on the streets, and we have to fight it. Now, the Greens are a good force in the South West. Some of my finest allies are there, and they respect the small number of us revolutionaries because we've got the tools and the dynamism, because we know that we are threatened with mass starvation, the destruction of life on the planet, total war, nuclear holocaust, and therefore we do not take revolutionary politics as a hobby. That is what we're here for. And every time a protest or anything of that sort that's organized by the Greens comes about, they are so grateful to have the comrades who are there with the skills and the abilities and the training to make it work. And we're grateful for the Greens to throw in there. Now, anything but the Tories, that was basically what we set up in Sidmouth. We swept the Tories off the council. We just did it. I mean, there were some Liberals, there were some Greens, there were some Socialists, and there were some One Nation Tories, perhaps. But we did it. And you can form these alliances. And I was forced at the last minute to stand in the election, and I stood in the most Tory seat in Exmouth, and I didn't go out to win the Tory vote, but I bloody nearly won it because I went door to door saying, we need council houses. Yes, said the well-heeled retired people. I was brought up in one. These poor young people, I'll vote for you. We need proper public transport. Absolutely, they said. And one by one, I went around Tory Littleham, and I, came, I was the runner-up to the Tories. I was nearly having to run the bloody bourgeois state in East Devon. <laughs> so how do we do politics? Don't follow Ben Bradshaw. You want to get the Tory vote? Don't worry about putting people off. People are gagging for revolutionary politics that cares for our planet and worries about our children. Absolutely. Stand up and say it. Jeremy Corbyn says it. Like the other JC, he's abandoned by his followers. Ben Thank you, comrade. Comrade. Thank you. Yep, okay. Well, I'd like to, first of all, thank Shara Ali for coming on behalf of the SWP and Marxism. Very good that he's come. And I'm really interested in what he had to say because I'd have thought that a lot of the pressures and tensions in the Green Party at the moment are probably quite similar to the Labour Party because actually they affect left electoral projects, don't they? That tension that exists between attracting people who are angry about austerity, racism and war and appealing, but that pressure about winning elections. In fact, actually, that's what they're for, about winning elections. That's the dominant thing that you're organising for. And the pressure of that is to about compromising and about you know, pulling back and appealing for broad repeal in the way that, that we heard. And I think it's interesting because the Greens have played an interesting role in the last year. You think about the run-ups of a general election before Corbynism. Actually, I thought it was people like Natalie Bennett, but Nicola Sturgeon, Leanne Woods. Do you remember that first uh, debate on the TV with Farage? And they shifted the debate, actually, to more left about immigration. That was good. It set the terrain. Um, I'd be quite interested. You see, I think a lot of people did join the Greens in the run-ups of general election. But I'm interested to see, because I think a lot of that's gone to Corbyn in the way that you say, and you know, how that's reflected. But has that then generated a bigger discussion in the Green Party, which had presented itself as quite anti-establishment, um, anti-neoliberal in the run-up to that general election, to pull back from that, to go for the traditional climate green uh, politics, which actually can reflect some of the more conservative elements. That's a question which I think would be a mistake right now, because actually there is a massive crisis 
We know that the Leave vote has generated crisis at the top. Part of it was an anti-establishment vote, but obviously there are questions of racism as well. How do you intervene the best? You don't do it by compromising with the right. You do it by standing firm on a number of principles, one of which is very clear about freedom of movement. Refugees welcome, but actually the freedom of movement for any workers to move. And sometimes the pressure of electoralism can pull you to compromise. And on that note, I'd just like to say about the BMP, I don't think anything's automatic on this question. You see, actually, is that to finish? Oh, okay. Um, you know, I, we are for debate. There's a difference with the Nazis, isn't it? Because they're about taking away the debate, literally, by killing people. That's why we say no platform, to draw a distinction between them and other right-wing politicians. And it wasn't automatic that they just lost their seats. It was the campaigning, knocking on the doors, both in the North West and in London, to convince people it made a difference. And I think now we have to do similar. We have to intervene very clearly in those debates, standing by question of principles, but actually not being pulled to the right by a misanalysis of the situation. And understanding it's not static. People aren't static. They can be pulled either way in a question of crisis and that's why the SWP is always on the streets or on strikes or on the on the ground because our orientation is on that idea that ordinary people through their own actions can bring about change not just politicians and that's why we orientate where they are and that's our predominancy not being pulled uh, in, into electoral politics in that way thank you Comrades, we've got about six minutes left. If it's possible that the last three speakers could please uh, try and keep it to two, two and a half minutes, I'd be really grateful. I'm going to be a bit of a pessimist here, and I'm going to, uh, I'm going to really bring something to your attention. I'm going to bring something to your attention, and I'm going to be a pessimist. And that is really, if uh, electing people to Parliament made a difference, the bourgeoisie would not allow it. And we have to realise that. And that's why we have to say... Okay, I like Corbyn, and I'm saying, this as a, uh, I'm saying this as an individual. I like Corbyn, I like the Labour Party. I think some of the stuff that they say is really good. But let's be honest with ourselves. There is no way to emancipate the working class all over the world, and that's why the Trotskyites here, it's because we believe in world revolution. There is no way to do it except if we do it by revolution. It's not by electing some people to office and by saying, oh, because they'll give us, I don't know, 15 pounds more, that's going to that's gonna sort us out. No, the system is corrupt, and even the left wing on the system uh, are, 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 can't really sort it out. They might be genuine, and I believe that the Green Party is genuine about what they want, and they want to help out the world and you know, and get the working class to have better conditions and end war. But the fact of the matter is, even if in some different universe they got elected to the majority and beat the Conservatives, the system is set up in a way that they could not change a thing. They could change some uh, some wages, they could put some more restrictions on CEOs, bonuses, but at the end of the day the system will remain the same so unless a vanguard arises to overthrow this capitalist system then we will still remain in the same condition lenin said this trotsky said this there we are the revolutionaries and we follow our beliefs we say that this system is corrupt and it needs there's no compromising with it we need to overthrow it now or never thank you very much thank you Uh, hi, uh, my name. So, can you hear me? Uh, my name's Rob. I'm from New MSWP branch, uh, and I want to um, first of all thank the speaker. I found the uh, talk really, really engaging and interesting. And I want to speak to some of the questions you asked, and also the one of the uh, first speakers who asked should they join the SWP. I wonder if you can guess what my answer is going to be. Um, and I think I think uh, one of the problems with a lot of green politics up until now has been that it fails to root itself in the struggle of the working class. Um, and I think that is why uh, green politi politicians and uh, members of the Green Party uh, do fail to constituate a significant amount of uh, the united fronts against fascism. Um, because largely the green, green movement uh, functions in two ways, and that's through uh, one through direct action, as you said. And direct action, of course, is valuable. It can often um, encourage the working class to act self-activity. But it is, in some ways, elitist, because uh, it, you know, it's an enlightened few taking a sort of an oversized impact in what's going on, and it is undemocratic. Um, and then through parliamentary means is the other way the Green Party uh, and uh, green politics often goes. Uh, which is, of course, valuable, and it can change the system, and it can make things better for ordinary people, but it ultimately doesn't, doesn't dismantle the ruling class or end capitalism, and therefore cannot um, save the planet. Um, and the only, So the only way to curb the capitalist destruction of the planet and of the environment is to empower the working class through self-activity, because only the working class have an interest in saving the planet. 
Um, and to what the speaker said about zero growth, capitalism must grow. It will always grow, otherwise it will fail. And uh, that is why and it, it will, it, capitalism will inevitably destroy the planet if we allow it to continue. And the only way we can save the planet is b by building a revolution. In one, and one impact of that in the short term is that we can force reform, not through asking nicely for it, not through being, uh, partly through being elected, but we can force reform through becoming more powerful as a class. And so what you said about um, does this mean that uh, it will increase poverty and housing? And no, of course it doesn't, because the problem is not a lack of growth. The problem is not the size of the cake. The problem is that uh, the ruling class, those in charge of society, refuse to distribute. And the, re this, this redistribution and the saving of the planet must and, and can only come from you direct democracy up. by working class people. So, yes, you should join the Socialist okay. Working Party. <laughs> I want to be very, very emphatic, which is I think I want to make it absolutely clear that I think it's crucial that green politics, green activists, environmental campaigners identify themselves as left-wing. And I do that not because I think it's an abstract label, and nor do I think it's about simply saying that people who are on, in the Green Party or elsewhere can only attract people who also identify as left-wing. The importance of being and declaring yourself left-wing is because it then gives you a strategy for changing the world and appealing to wider layers of people. You see, if you say you're on the left, what you can also then say to people in the rural parts of England as much as the cities is we have a vision of a different way of organising society. We can relate to those people who are worried about jobs in Lancashire and who are looking to the fracking companies to provide employment by saying, actually, imagine this place with renewable en energy. That's how we can provide jobs. They're better jobs. They're cleaner jobs and the, and, the, uh, and, the, and, the, and the rest of the things. And I don't think we should be frightened as environmental activists about the label left wing. I, I, I actually slightly disagree with the speaker. I think there's a long tradition going all the way back to Karl Marx and William Morris about people on the left, the socialists and Marxists, identifying with the vision of a green, sustainable world. William Morris's news from nowhere is a, is a vision of a sustainable planet, not one that I would share, but it's a vision of it. Marx, his capital is littered with a critique of the way that the system pollutes and destroys people's lives and its endless desire to make profits and accumulate wealth for the sake of, uh, of, uh, of accumulation. I think the importance here is what is our goal? Our goal is that sustainable world. Our goal is that world of equality and an end to poverty and social, social justice. But we also have to then add on to that. What sort of equality? What sort of justice? Because effectively we have political equality, but we don't have economic equality. And if we want economic equality, then we have to start saying we want to challenge the system, the fundamental system. And that's why I think that we have to start uh, from a left-wing point of view. It gives us a route into a vision of a society where we can end exploitation, we can end oppression, we can end the system degradation and, and destruction of the natural world and build that sustainable future. Alongside, I think socialists and greens will have enormous numbers of debates. We already have at this event and over the years and, you know, uh, in, a, in our environment. And I want to link arms with as many members of the Green Party as possible to stop the fracking lorries, to, to stop the BNP when they want to march, to stop the, the fascists, to, 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 to fight for better jobs, better pay and, uh, and equality and against oppression. We'll have those discussions. We can do them hand in hand, but ultimately, well, let's do them as a unified movement that says the capitalism is the problem and the solution of the ordinary people who, who, who can change it. Thank you very much to everyone. We had seven people in the edition who wanted to speak and I'm sorry there's just, just no time and hopefully you can continue the debate the debate afterwards. A couple of announcements. Um, Tim Saunders, socialist worker cartoonist, is doing an illustrated talk about his recent trip to Palestine at 1pm in drama after the BDS session. And Nicola Field is signing copies of her book Over the Rainbow, Money, Class and Homophobia outside Jeffrey Hall at 8.30pm today. Um, I'm sure you found Bookmarks, a socialist bookshop outside the Institute Bar. Lots of books. We've got um, Lands and Labour by Martin Empson and his pamphlet Marxism and Ecology, One Million Climate Jobs pamphlet and loads of others they're available here and also uh, in the bookshop uh, any further questions please do speak to those with red swp forms who will be at the back at the end um, and thank you to everyone who contributed i'm going to bring uh, sharap back to uh, answer some of your questions thanks no pressure there then um, okay well actually i'm not feeling under siege except by the quality of the questions which is absolutely fantastic no that's really good uh, let me just try and go through them in sort of relatively serial order um, 
the first uh, questioner actually was referring to what is tend to be labelled now as progressive alliance. Now, it's funny because uh, part of what I'm going to go on to in a minute as well is to do with self-identity. Um, the last person was also addressing the issue about class. Now, I think one of our problems is, is that if we undertake an analysis, intellectual analysis, of course, of the problem, the political problem, the structural problem, if our analysis doesn't coalesce or isn't, doesn't, if we don't concur in our analysis, let's say it's a class analysis, with somebody else whose ends are the same, does that mean we're not going to get together and pursue that same end? I don't think that should be an impediment to our identifying where our ends converge, even if our analysis doesn't. And one of the problems of a potentially a class analysis, dare I say, if you want to say that, get in there through the worker struggle. I mean, I do. I'm campaigning for the SOAS cleaners. I'm campaigning against all those um, marginalised in, in my workplace. If we're going to say that we have to go in through that route, then we're selling ourselves short because there are lots of other routes as well. And there are those people who, rightly or wrongly, do not identify on class lines. The ultimate broker, I think, of our commonality and identity and enable to unify around a certain purpose is the human race. We have to say it's our common humanity over and above everything that is actually going to help us um, pursue this common end. So in terms of the Progressive Alliance, what I was going to start by saying was Progressive Alliance, to me, sounds like a slightly classist label. Yeah? It's, it's a very intellectual label for something which is just co-working, collaboration, and pursuing politics beyond the narrow confines of party politics. If a progressive alliance is something which is people from any party or none coming together with or without their banners and coalescing around a common cause, then why, it, that's all it is. It's people uniting, coming together. By calling it a progressive alliance, you're sticking a label on it, yes, which might actually already exclude some people from something which they would identify with otherwise. Ethnic minorities. I mean, there's going to be some kind of warts and all stuff, which I'm not going to share with this room. Friends, there. Oh, okay, I will. Are you recording this? That's the problem, you see. No, well, the thing is, is that, look, any organisation, any organisation, yes, is going to encounter problems of establishment at the end of the day, of people even getting into Parliament. I'm certainly not referring to anybody in the Green Party, of course not, but the point is that getting into, the, getting into politics and being seduced by power that's something which we all face is a problem. Once you actually try and fight the system from within, there's going to be a danger, a difficulty, a challenge of your actually being seduced by that and becoming like the very thing which you said you were ultimately going to bring the downfall of. I'm not particularly happy, or I will say this, I'm not particularly happy, for example, that we have a peer in the House of Lords, not that we have one at all. The idea was that we need to use that to facilitate the bringing down of the House of Lords. And I think that there should be a lot of energy put into that within that particular system. If you look at the House of Commons, ultimately, we do say that there is a place and will remain one to stand for election, to engage with the electoral process that we currently have. Flawed that it is, grossly inadequate that it is. First past the post, massive disproportionality in the last uh, election uh, when you look at his historically. But the reason that we engage is because we don't just do that. We understand that politics is all around. Politics is in the workplace. Politics is in our campaigning. We are, I would suggest, first and foremost, a campaigning organisation, the Green Party I refer to. Because when we get elected, that's not an end in itself. It's a means to an end. I regularly get described as a councillor. I was even you know, reading a paper after the last local election. Somebody said, congratulations. I said, I haven't been elected. I said, yes, you have. I said, look, it's not in the paper. I haven't been elected. Said, because the things that you do at the grassroots that people identify, they see that you're doing more than your common or garden councillor. So at the end of the day, you're doing just as much without being elected. But if and when you do get elected, and when I'm putting together sort of slates of candidates and they're saying, look, there's a problem here, Shara, because if I get in and I've had no preparation and all the rest of it, then what am I going to do? I don't know what to do. And I said, well, you'll be a damn sight better by doing nothing than some of that that the current population are currently putting in. So that's a consequentiality about it. And also, if we're in the chamber actually casting our votes and impeding, warmongering, we're doing some good. So I would say, absolutely, use your vote, register to vote, get... 
that gentleman there actually got to address you immediately. Absolutely fantastic. And if you give that kind of elevator pitch on the doorstep, no wonder people are going to vote for you. Because the point is this, that there are there's some of the people who don't engage, who feel that it's not worth engaging. If we can just galvanise them, then we'll be more than enough, even without having um, anybody but the, but, but the Tory party. We can have lots of people going in on their own terms against the Tory party if we get those people uh, engaged in politics. In terms of street activism, um, it's a Green Party member from... Where's she, where's she gone? Right. Look, I think, I think there is an issue there because one of the labels that is... Uh, often, even amongst the Green Party, white middle class, academic types. Yeah? So I got up in a room once and said, I'm not white, which suggesting potentially that I might be middle class academic type. But the thing is, is look, <laughs> even, where, where, what, is, what is intelligence? What is intellect? It doesn't result, it, it's not a consequence of having degrees even. So it might be something, the veneer of educatedness, yes, which is the problem. And that if people self-identify identify with this kind of false hierarchy of education, then that's what's actually preventing them from engaging with people who are as educated, doubly educated to them. And so I think that part of the problem then with, uh, if you like, the street activism, even in, and there's a very good analysis somebody's just given me about, you know, non-violent direct action. Now, there is, that, that's interesting you say that, because even with the Heathrow 13, even with the kind of non-violent direct actions that we rely upon, often it's in order to bounce the media into looking at us. It's not total non-violent direct activism. It's much more to do with trying to use the media. And I think if we become so obsessed with the media, what we actually do is we disempower ourselves. You know, whether it's like politics, I mean, even in recent campaigns, I was actually, in my own meetings, organisational meetings, I was thinking, why are we spending half an hour talking about Twitter? You know, come off it. That's not what I went into politics for, yes? And I think that we've got to understand, you know, let other people do the, the tweeting and retweeting. Can you retweet that? No, no, not really. But the thing is that, the thing is, is that we've got to make sure, yeah? We've got to make sure we don't lose sight of, of the ball and the target. And I think that there is an energy about your movement. There is an energy about the kind of the grassroots mobilisation that we talk the talk, and maybe it's true, we don't walk the walk in every department, and I think I would, hats up, you know, hands up, I think that there is improvement there, and there's things that we can learn from your energy and vitality by joining with you in ever greater numbers. In terms of, um, Tina was, was talking about the climate agenda, the fact that, which really warms to me, given what I was saying about inclusivity and future generations, people who aren't around yet, People who can't press their claim on us, but I think they have a right to a claim upon us and to be taken into consideration in our decision making, even though we can't name them, we know that they're going to be around. And I would suggest that another way, which I haven't mentioned yet, and nobody yet has, is climate justice, eco-justice. It's a nice buzzword. It's a nice way of trying to draw attention to the fact that climate change predominantly affects both those least responsible for those negative consequences and low lying coastal areas in Bangladesh, those least responsible, it's a double injustice, and those least able to afford the remedial action to contend with it. And that's why climate is also a justice issue. And I think we get that. And that's one way, I think, very easily and readily of bringing environmentalists on board and therefore being some cross-pollination, if you want to call it that. In terms of electoral politics, you know, I think the, the sentiment being about busted flush, I hope that I've sort of um, addressed that to some extent. I think it's not either or. I think it's all inclusive. And when you get into the House of Commons or, or whatever, you know, you're going to be, I hope, you're going to maintain that vitality and bring people over. Um, in terms of um, Amy, you were asking me, I think, you know, if some insight about, you know, in the Green Party, what sort of messaging, strategizing, political revision did we have, if at all, after Corbyn? Now, I would suggest that what we shouldn't be doing is, is thinking, well, Corbyn and co are on our turf. Um, it might affect our unique selling point or whatever. That isn't what it should be. And I hope that, you know, as long as I've got some influence over proceedings, that we bolster each other. Not only because of the number of people who are currently not voting for us. What I think it served, the purpose I think it served, even in the early days when Corbyn was talking about um, pulling out of NATO or unilateral nuclear disarmament if necessary, although that caused screams, 
house in, in the Labour Party, particularly the Parliamentary Labour Party. In the Green Party, that's our common position. It's a un united position. So from our point of view, I think it was lending credibility to a viewpoint which I would be very happy to argue to the masses on a daily basis. So I think in a way, it helps us. It gives us credibility. Maybe presentationally there are some things which could be improved, but I think it gets the arguments out there. And I think one of the things that people have an appetite for is policy, is policy not veneer not sharp-suited, identikit politicians um, like Bradshaw. And um, the, system, the system will stay the same. Now, it, um, this gentleman talking about being pessimistic. Well, oh, I had a great jibe, actually, about being pessimistic as well, but actually defeating your opening analysis. Um, yeah, here it is. See, the thing is, is that you want overthrow, you want a kind of a revolution. And the Green Party sometimes talks about you know, a peaceful revolution. That's partly through electoral method and maybe other things besides. My other pessimistic counter answer is this. When we marched on the streets, people often say two million, personally I think it was one million, but the point is, is that in the build up to the Iraq war, we threatened, not just not in my name, not in my name, what's the wor what worth is not in my name? Yeah? Over my dead body maybe, or I will bring the country to a standstill. People threatened to bring the country to a standstill, yes? if Blair went to war. And did we? So if you can't mobilize people when you've got people having bombs rained upon them in Iraq, yeah? families, innocent people, let's just substitute one set of people who are being uh, killed under a despotic regime with another one, our bombs. But guess what? In this case, we're killing them in order to save them. I mean, the hypocrisy of that. So yes, we couldn't even bring the country to a standstill. I nearly lost my job, I'm proud to say. People were saying to me, why on earth did you print details of Colin Powell's visit to, the uni to a university? Yes, I'm not allowed to say the name. But why on earth did you publicize the security arrangements and then ultimately um, sabotage the proceedings, Channel 4 News, we are unable to confirm or deny whether this is for security reasons? Of course it was. You know, it's a kind of public interest disclosure. Why? Of course I knew what I was doing. I was risking my job. And if the number of people who said to me and supported me, and I finally got through that uh, particular disciplinary hearing, if all those people had actually come with me at the same time and said, we're not going into work today, we're going to bring the country to a standstill, we could have brought the country to a standstill. And even now, with the Chilcot on the horizon, we've got to make sure that the warmongers, that the Blairites, the warmongers, I bumped into, not bumped into, passed him before I realised who it was, Jeff Hoon. All those warmongers need to be brought to book to the International Criminal Tribunal to make sure that future leaders do not think they can get away with it. And there's a reason why Blair looks harassed, and let's make sure he's particularly harassed in the next few days. Um, finally, in terms of, so that's my pessimism, yes? And I think we need to broaden that church, and it might have to be a peaceful revolution of, of sorts. In terms of, finally, um, that's enough, thanks. <laughs>